tell you what to do. <laughs> all right, we're going to get started. Uh, so good morning. Thank you all for coming. Our speaker today is Chris Martins from Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Uh, Chris is a distinguished professor in the Marine Science Department at University of North Carolina. Uh, I met Chris my first day of college when I walked into a seminar class and after a couple weeks of talking to him about research he asked me to join his group and I did and here we are today. Um, so Chris grew up in Florida in the Florida Keys. He uh, did his undergrad at FSU and stayed for a PhD and now is doing research on biogeochemical processes, nitrogen and carbon cycling in coral reefs, deep cold seeps, and tropical rainforests. And his talk today is on methane plumes in the northern Gulf of Mexico. Chris? Thanks, Sarah. Is it on? Yeah. Good. Uh, I know that I have to stand in this area, and I'm, I, this is my first chance to imitate Steve Jobs. <laughs> so, so on we go. Um, I wanna, today I want to bring you up to date a little bit on um, one aspect of our work. That is the work that's uh, happened in the northern Gulf. It actually began during the days of gas hydrate research, um, run by the late, great Robert Woolsey at the University of Mississippi formed a little consortium, um, invited people in who were ac active in methane research and stuff in particular because of the gas hydrate action out there. And so we began to uh, explore what we could do in deep waters as opposed to the coastal stuff that we were used to doing, although we had been working offshore, off North Carolina. Uh, we'll end with a little, a few little descriptions of what's going on offshore, off North Carolina later. Uh, so what I wanted to do is bring you up to date with what we've been able to do with the uh, uh, Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative, GOMRI. Uh, I'm part of a consortium called EcoGig. <laughs> yeah, I made that up as a joke and sent it to Mandy Joy and she liked it. <laughs> Ecosystem impacts of oil and gas inputs to the Gulf. I did it as a joke. But EcoGig caught on and it's, uh, it's gone through a couple of funding cycles and we've, we've been able to, to do some really interesting things. And so let's move along. I want to, before I say anything else, of course, this is a partial list of people who have really made EcoGig go. Um, and so I just want to mention that uh, everybody that's on the list has been at sea as part of this work and has contributed directly. I'm sort of the spokesperson for a group, in other words. Okay. Yeah. Go, go, go. It went, finally. Uh, I was going to sing if it didn't happen and we couldn't see the slideshow, but I guess I will have to see the slideshow. Are you all familiar with this awful photograph and stuff? But I think we also all know that um, the action wasn't just at the surface with oil accumulating up there, an amazing amount of the hydrocarbons coming out of the Macondo wellhead um, stayed down. Probably still not well known as to how much stayed down, but it, and because it's moving around and so forth. So these are shots, those dramatic shots that came up of what was happening down in the wellhead with the sheared up pipe and the 84 days that it took to seal it off with 220 million gallons of oil and gas coming up in the slick you can see here, but I want to make sure that you also see, I'll show a little better slide here in a moment. The little curly cues here, I think the next slide shows it in a little more detail. We will talk a little bit about inertial waves in the ocean, but I want you to notice this curly cue shape. This is material coming up from natural seeps that was near this area, okay? And so we'll be, um, we were not able during this time period to do the very simple measurement of methane with time down in the deep waters. It wasn't possible. There were some sensors out, like MET sensors from Franitech, little chip detectors and so forth that, that sometimes worked, sometimes didn't. It was tough to get them. They were high powered. They had to be pumped and all the rest of it. But simply it was, it was shipboard work where you grabbed samples, brought them up for the most part with attempts to use MIMS. Some of you use, I know Bezat has MIMS technology here. There were attempts to use in to two MIMS in this site, Rich Camilli at Woods Hole, other people, uh, Tim Short down at USF, 
There's some major Herculean efforts, but it was tough. As you all know uh, that work with this instrumentation, MIMS are tremendously temperature sensitive. So it was a real tough ball game to do this kind of in situ work. Uh, I just borrowed this, this uh, little slide from USF people. Uh, and, and what it's basically indicating is once that oil and, and gas we're going to look at the proportions are coming out. Not all of it was making to the surface. Uh, it turned out that there were these subsurface plumes that have now been made famous by people like Mandy Joy and others. Uh, and in fact, here's one of Mandy's uh, slides showing early CDOM numbers down deep that really sort of shocked everyone. What's that stuff doing down there? When you do profiling on down, I'm sorry, you can't see the scale. It's the quality of the slide not the projection, but uh, as you go down deep, down below 1,500 meters and stuff, you were seeing this, this, this obvious signature of a plume of material down there probably moving around. And here's a little slide. The only reason I put this one up, of course, this is a cartoon representation of plumes forming down deep. But look at over here at how, many, how much of the gas coming out and just know that in red is the part of the the hydrocarbons that's there as methane. Okay, so a lot of what was coming out was methane, other light hydrocarbons, but really important. So this is the way it was gotten after, of course, ships out. UNC, by chance, had a cruise out, Andres Teske's group, and was on the scene right away, able to do some early microbial work. Um, that's an, uh, something we'll mention a little later. If you go out and make these kinds of measurements, and here's some data from Cedric Megan, a gifted chemical engineer now up at uh, University of Maryland's lab in Solomons, um, along with uh, Laura Lapham from our group. Um, if you look at data from Cedric, the green dots and so forth, what you see is sort of a gathering of higher methane within what we call the friction layer, where you really, the bottom friction and so forth is really affecting. So in the Gulf, that's about a 50 meter off the bottom feature. Uh, maybe we'll have time to look at a little of the physical data. Uh, but but uh, Mandy went out trying to get in the plume and out of the plume. It's a tough ball game that some of you know about. And so there's some numbers that are high, but usually you're seeing something close to the two to three nanomolar that you expect for equilibrium with the atmosphere. A lot of work on this kind of stuff was done in the northern Gulf in the 60s and so forth. Um, so will Lindenbaum and Swinnerton, famous people at NRL labs and stuff. So there's a lot of that. And usually that's what you're seeing. But if you get down in that friction layer, whoop, sorry, you see uh, I, it was predicted that that would happen. Yeah. Uh, you see these high concentrations. And notice that we're talking 50 nanomolar. It's not super high, but it's, 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 it's well above. Uh, equilibrium, so it's clearly a source effect that's local. So the water down there is moving around. Remember the little pigtail seep that I showed you? It's moving around. Think of a dinner plate going over a source, and you're, we're going we're gonna to actually look at it from that perspective. <clears throat> the EcoGig people got after working not only near the Deepwater Horizon site over here, the Macondo Wellhead area, but also went over to Green Canyon and uh, uh, other sites, we'll look at uh, another one that we spent a good time at, Bush Hill, uh, where there's hydrate mounds and so forth that are exposed. Because we wanted to, we were after the, the main spill action, we wanted to learn how to work with deep water injections of methane in particular and other hydrocarbons. So we chose to work at natural seep sites all around the place. And I think the next slide, oh, the color coding here, of course, is for where you have corals, cold water corals. Chuck Fisher was the lead dog in EcoGig work on what had happened to the deep water, cold water, whichever you want to call it, corals. Natural seep sites in blue. Uh, some, uh, some featuring anthropogenic impacts from release sites to Taylor Energy and so forth, famous for uh, that over to the west. Okay, and so we went over to the Green Canyon area, famous for the identification of lots of seeps along this axis, along this ridge. Uh, they even have names, mega plume, birthday candles, and so forth. They're visible even by, by roves pretty easily. But uh, if you do sonar hits in this area, this is from Ian McDonald's group at Florida State and others of his colleagues. Um, you look along that ridge that I showed in the previous slide. And here you're at about uh, 
1180 to 1220 meters depth, you see repeated sonar hits when you just do a sonar scan, it's bat gas bubble plumes coming up. So this ridge is particularly loaded with these seeps. Um, so let's go over to GC 185 and we'll show where it is on that map again later on. And the attraction here, I don't know if you can see it. Again, it's probably my slide, but these, you see these bubble plumes rising? Uh, we learned in my group years ago in, from work in Cape Lookout where it bubbles every low tide. Um, there's lots of organic rich axle grease mud in about uh, eight meters of water and on the low tide the gas that's built up in the sediment expands and comes out of what we call bubble tubes so you get streams of gas coming out well here come the streams the important point here is that the bubbles dissolve pretty rapidly and you use the same kind of boundary layer laminar layer modeling that you use for air water gas exchange studies to model what's happening only the bubble is rising so it's a little atmosphere doing air water gas exchange and that's how we're injecting this methane that we're going to be looking at into the water column mostly from these rising bubbles it's not diffusion out and if it's a great big bubble release you don't get much of an effect from that it's too fast as it heads for the surface Okay, so we've added in a station here that I want to show you some data from uh, Bush Hill, which I just showed a slide of what it looks like on the seafloor. And so I'm going to focus our attention on GC185 and GC600, where we have pretty good time series data. But I also want to mention sites that we haven't been able to successfully do time series monitoring at. We think that as you go deeper out, there's going to be a lot more uh, the, the deep water deposits are probably more gas rich and so we think there's going to be a lot of action in these places and the reason in part for that many of you have been out in cruises in these areas is these sl little slicks from rising bubbles that hit the surface and spread out right okay so we started out with these big landers like you see are relatively big landers with our gear on board um, and I want to show you some early data that that got us going um, this is the first ever methane time series data from a background site down here and you notice this nanomolar scale it's actually and we probably have some calibration issues at this point um, with MET sensors um, but it's definitely down in that atmospheric equilibrium value around uh, less than two but it, that's probably erroneous the error bars in these data are probably big if you get near uh, GC 600 site uh, in about 1222 meters in this case and you put out gear that you can keep down for a significant period of time notice that we're talking if you can't see it April 29th all the way into early June um, we were able to actually get this gear going using uh, partnerships with companies that built underwater power sources that were really useful to us uh, these are pumped METS sensor data and if you were to look more closely at, at this data you'd see that these weren't one point peaks this is real methane time series and I, immediately it became obvious that if the bubbling was relatively constant which it's not but uh, some people in Jeff Chanton's group have done some work on this using videography Carolyn whose last name I can't remember just finished her PhD work there I apologize to Carolyn at any rate she, th there is periodicity in what's going on down there but we think there's more than that going on and so what we had on our data, we had also a little ADCP, a little 600 kilohertz ADCP units on our landers. At first we just had single point data. And so you're looking at currents that are 5 to 10 centimeters per second. On average, all the black dots are individual measurements. You also see the tide range, which turns out to be about 70 centimeters. And of course, from Cape Lookout, I was looking for low tide bubbling. Ha ha. 70 meters out of 1122, uh, 1222. So I don't, but people were still interested in whether that could be the case. But I also wanted to show you, this is oxygen data. We're working in Antarctic intermediate water. We're down deep enough that that's what's down there. Look at the temperature data. This is the time when Hurricane Isaac came across. You remember Isaac? It was a little one compared to some of the others and moving pretty fast, but it came through in late August. And look at what happened down deep at, at our GC600 site to the temperature. It all of a sudden jacked, and the jacking is a couple of tenths of a degree Celsius, really significant. And look at oxygen, the big drop. What's happening out there that's really interesting is this large-scale sloshing 
that uh, people at Woods Hole and Lamont and stuff have been working on for some time, and I'm not going to remember the names of the group that's doing it, but it's very interesting what the big storms are doing on a large scale out there. Let's go on. So um, this is at one of those areas along that ridge. Uh, here's how we started looking at our data at first. We were looking for showing it, this is concentrations going out in nanomolar, and you could see we were sometimes of over 200 nanomolar, rarely. More typically, we were in this um, two to a little over 100 nanomolar, just like Mobile Bay. Different source, though, if you were to do the stable isotopes on this methane, it's thermogenic. It's going to be minus 40 per mil for those of you that are stable carbon isotope buffs. What was more interesting to me was trying to deal with this idea that there are plumes out there. I guarantee you they're out there, but I don't have the proof for it necessarily. But, so get some. So um, these numbers just refer to the uh, uh, Gomri um, website that has data sets on it. Anyway, what you're looking at here is a progressive vector diagram calculation in which we're following water that's moving in different directions over our lander. The color code, which isn't showing up too well here, I should have made this bar bigger. When it's dark red, we're up in the 100 nanomolar range. I don't know if you can see, but you can see that sometimes it's in that range and sometimes it's lower. It turns out that if you look carefully at data like this, you can see when water coming from a seep, if you've got one located, in this case we think it's mainly mega plume that's supplying this methane, we can actually see if water is coming from that direction towards our lander we'll see high methane, and if it's not, or it's coming past it, it, you'll drop. So we're into this business of actually trying to follow a plume using a single lander at a single site. The good news is that we can put the lander within two meters now of where we want it to be, and I'll show you the gear that we use to do that in a second. Okay, so there we were with um, the gear that we had. Along came Gomri. But there wasn't enough money. They didn't want to pay for equipment. So I have gone into partnership with a bunch of companies. I think it's one of the ways of the future. The funding situations, I think we're all interested in what's going to happen. So I've partnered with uh, a couple of uh, German companies, Divalogic in Hamburg, my father's hometown, Franitech, also in that area off in Lundberg, um, a Norwegian company, Andra Data Instruments, and monitor instruments, now out of business, but uh, creator of the underwater MIMS mass, underwater membrane inlet mass spectrometers that we use. Um, so I simply want to say that a, a lot of what we've been able to do rests on the fact that we've been able to go into these partnerships with companies. What they want from us is real data that makes their instrumentation um, viable in the marketplace. They, but they don't have access to the cruise ship action. They don't necessarily have people that are used to doing field work. All of us, um, what would you call us, wild field scientists, we do things that people who want to hang in labs don't want to do. And so there's, uh, they need us, we need them, and the way to make that work is to get inside and convince them that you can do something that they can't do and then ask them for free instrumentation. Yeah. So they'll make you pay a little bit typically, but and then they'll give way on that when the invoice comes and your grant didn't get funded. Just say, oh, I'll pay you next year. Uh, okay. This is the first um, of, uh, I think there are now some others out on the market. This is a, this is a Franitech laser methane sensor. It has a very special diode laser inside it. Big membrane on the outside for equilibration. It has to be pumped. I'll show you it uh, because you want to have water flowing past this membrane. And uh, if, if you get it at a reasonable speed, you can calibrate this laser thing. The great news is you can turn it off and turn it back on. You can duty cycle this thing. With the MET sensors, I didn't mention it, but we would turn them on, use a lot of what battery power we had, typically 220 amp hour battery packs. Um, and it's 2,000 bucks to load them up with lithium batteries, 130 batteries per power pack. Yeah. And so every time it goes over the side, wave by by to two grand, it's just in battery power. So I wanted something that could extend our time our ability to make measurements and so forth. These are prototype instruments and that's part of the game that you play when you're partnering with companies, right? You need engineering talent inside your group. 
And so the reason you'll keep seeing Howard Menlovitz's name when I'm giving credits for who did what, where, and where thing is that he's a combo engineer who can fix anything. No one has ever come to repair an instrument in my lab ever from a company in the last 24 years because Howard can do it all. So that kind of partnership is also something that I think all young people, uh, of course I'm one of those, right? Yeah, all, everybody will be looking for in the future is partnering. We're all in this together. I think we need more engineering staff around us and we need to uh, treat them we need to have them as our total buddies. Anyway, that instrument we tested in the lab here, it's in its little cap, so we can pump water over the membrane, and that's what we do underwater as well. And so um, this is how we would calibrate such an instrument, methane concentrations. We'd put it in a big tank, uh, the, the instrument itself, along with optode sensors, methane sensors, met sensors, and we'd also do GC measurements. So the GC measurements are kind of sporadic, Okay, here, but the laser's doing its thing and cycling somewhat. Okay, we've been able to cut out that noise somewhat, but there's a big initialization peak and then we're right on. We, so the, we were able to convince ourselves that these lasers would work underwater. Well, and our first test was to get in a cruise in 2014 with, led by Manny Joy to the brine pools and so forth. Um, and we, we took a part off of the deck of the A2 and turned it into an elevator. Yeah, they, they let us do this. They're good guys. But the ship is now done, right? So it didn't matter anyway. But we got a part of the deck here. At any rate, we, we put our uh, a regular battery pack on it because we can recharge these. Here's our laser sensor wrapped in a logger beside it and a little single point acoustic Doppler instrument. And we put it down right next to this little probe marker where there's a small gas seep going. And look at what we found. On the left is away from that seep by about 100 meters methane. Okay. You've seen this data before, right? Zero to 150 nanomolar. You're used to this kind of thing, so we're out there and we're in the friction layer. So it should be more like 40 to 50, like you saw. Remember uh, Mandy's data and Cedric Megan's data? So in that range, very reasonable. Then we stuck the snout, the intake, Remember, it's a pump sensor. We pump everything through, uh, and we put the intake right into a bubble stream, inverted, up, upward pointed so that it wouldn't suck in a bubble. And look at the scale here. I've changed scales on you from that to thousands of nanomolar. So when you're right in a stream, you can get into the thousands of nanomolar. I'm not surprised that it's not easily into high micro, tens of micromolar level, because the bubbles are just on their way up. There's time for them to dissolve. In Cape Lookout, you lose about, in just a 10 meter water column, you, use, you lose about 10% of the bubble mass. But it happens pretty fast. You all have done this experiment before. You all had fish tanks when you were kids, right? And you had to aerate the thing to keep the fish from dying because you overfed them. Yeah, and so the, uh, the gas exchange rate is very fast when you have tiny, tiny bubbles. The bigger the bubbles, the slower the exchange. So, you know, there's lots of factors that enter into this variability that you see. Okay. Feel free to interrupt me at any time if you have a question about something you're seeing. Very happy to digress. Okay, this is what we were able to do with laser sensor and with DivaLogic. DivaLogic's great with subsea systems, especially acoustics. So this, be, this is what we call a mini lander. First tests in September 2015. So we had... Uh, profiling ADCPs at this point, 600 kilohertz, so we would really work almost throughout the friction layer. We could see current speeds and directions from 2 to 30 meters above the bottom, which is really good coverage for here. Not enough turbidity at some times to really get the, the acoustic reflections that you need, but, uh, and I wish we could handle 300 kilohertz ADCPs, but these cost $15,000. And those of you that use the big ones know that they're more like 40. Okay, and I couldn't afford, and there's, didn't have the weight. Syntactic foam, a pop-up buoy was added here. We'll see some data from that later. Here's the brains of the system are in the end of the new battery containers here, which are titanium bottles with 131 cells. And always, I always have to say, and it cost me $2,000 every time I put one down, which it does. Okay, and here's the laser sensor in place. So everything, lots of optodes in this cylinder here. We're messing with measuring benthic oxygen demand. If you're putting a lander down, why not stick an uh, open cylinder into the mud beside it 
and stick some optodes on it so we're really messing around here, four optodes, and measure the concentration gradient in the cylinder. Now, if you know current speeds you, and you know the size of the cylinder mouth, you can calculate an eddy diffusivity that must be going on as a function of current speed for the physical oceanographers in the group. Only there's one thing that's really wrong with this system. It's an apparent sediment oxygen demand that you're getting because you're altering the shape of the oxygen profile because you've got it in a cylinder, right? So, but at least I can get numbers out of this and by messing around with it, I'm able to get close to uh, what people predict for upper slope oxygen demand. This is a work in progress. So we went out to deploy our sensors at, at Green Canyon 600 and we encountered an eddy from the loop current. You're all used to that too, aren't you, around here? here oh, whoops, I'm pushing the wrong thing again. If I can get this right. Okay, so three to four knots. Uh, we weren't going to put down our landers here. Uh, we simply couldn't put them into a position. We had to give it up. I mean, the sway, the, the, the offsets would have been horrendous. So we moved over to Horn Dome, over in this area, close to 100 miles out from Gulfport. And we put down two mini landers, mini lander mini one and mini two, for first starters. Here was our first launch, the pop-up buoy snagged. <laughs> the mini lander slid. I don't know if it shows very well. Uh, and we lost it. My $200,000 mini lander number two. The good news is we got it back. Yeah, we, the, a company went out and retrieved it. Uh, the insurance company paid some money and, and it then was given to us. Nobody could figure out what to do with it and I wasn't telling them. So it's, it just came back to my lab uh, a couple of days ago. This is how we put them down. We put This is I Spider from U University of Mississippi, Max Woolsey, a really brilliant young man over at uh, University of Mississippi working with Vernon Asper and that crowd. Um, put together this little apparatus that allows us to video. So this is in video and we can watch it doing its thing and getting messed up, which is kind of sad. I wanted a really nice video, didn't get it. Okay, so here's the time series data we got from the other one that didn't get lost, data from when, on our next cruise when we did get to go over to GC600. And what you're looking at is data in red and blue, where should be the higher methane concentration? You're in the friction layer. We're able to pop a buoy up 10 meters above the bottom automatically and collect data from there by switching the laser sensor between sensing what water is coming from up above. We pump it down using that same intec versus what's coming in right at, at the lander height, about a meter above bottom. And so you're seeing pretty good agreement between these data. We're expecting to see bigger differences in some site, sites. It all depends on how much eddy turbulence is going on in the friction layer, right? So that's what the data looks like. But looking closer at, at one day, period in time, um, I think I've got the day up there, but it doesn't matter. This is uh, one meter depth is the, is the blue, and the red is the uh, 10 meters up above. You notice that there's e, and then e, there's, and then we're turning off for three hours. So we're on for three hours, off for three hours to save battery power. So we're able to duty cycle because it's a laser. What's all this about? That's membrane equilibration action. So a laser sensor like this, the one problem that it really has is it's about a 10 to 20 minute equilibration time that's being worked on now. But there, that's, a, that's a weakness compared to a MIMS instrument that can go underwater that can equilibrate maybe in 15 seconds. Bezat, I'm thinking 15 seconds is what we can do with our underwater ones. But the temperature effects have kept us from being able to successfully do this kind of work down deep. So does everybody see what we're using here? We're looking at a three hour period and we're sucking water from a near bottom. I'm sorry, I've got it backwards, don't I? From 10 meters is red and one meter is blue and you're seeing these change. Some of it's temporal, some of it's the sensor. Okay, response time. This is, I'm gonna, I'm hoping that this will run. I don't guess it's gonna run. This is my favorite way of doing this data. Uh, I wanna see if I can make it, there it is. Isn't that fun? Time series, think of that. So you can, you can fix your little um, software to run and you can see red and blue and you know that 
uh, blues up and reds down. And there are times, we're going to look at this data in a different way in a minute, but I just want to show you the kind of fun we're having. And the, no, notice the nanomolar scale up, up here in the hundreds when it gets high. We sometimes see a thousand nanomolar. So we get into the micromolar range over at Bush Hill where those gas plumes are up and everything. Let's move on. Okay, so you could average all that data and make it much more boring. So I've done that for us here, you know, up, down, up, down, but it's hard to even see. This is when I've tried to do the first attempt at filtering the data and correcting for those response time things. Let's go to GC 185, back to Bush Hill, and look at some data from there. I haven't done anything yet um, with, the, with trying to filter out this data, but look at the concentrations. We're sometimes over 300 uh, nanomolar there, and there we, only, we didn't have the, the pop-up buoy system. We're only working right at one meter off the seafloor. But you can see this typical thing when you're down in the friction layer near a sea, you're seeing these elevated methane concentrations, and the variation with time isn't just the source changing, it's the water moving around, carrying. So you want to do the physical oceanography and the chemical oceanography if you're going to understand what's going on. So plumes, this is, I think, really important stuff to get after in the northern Gulf. Um, so here's, here's what we're able to do now with our 600 kilohertz um, ADCPs. Blue is low current speed. This is just direction. And I'll just say, to not have us go blind, uh, mostly north, northwest, uh, south, southeast flow, back and forth in this part uh, off of GC600. And, but you can see lo the current speed goes through changes, and so do the directions. And if, so we're now into relating what we see. And here's, for example, the, that data from GC600 that had the data from 1 meter and 10. We're comparing. And so we see high concentrations when current speeds drop. That makes perfect sense, the turbulent mixing. Once it, uh, it, it gets going, um, you, you screw things up. If you slow things down, low current speeds, five centimeters a second or less, and you can actually see the methane. So not only is there the water transport action, there's also the turbulent mixing that's going to have to be dealt with to understand what's happening with these plumes. But in a way, this is the punchline of what we're talking about today. There's, there's these plumes running around everywhere, and I think you all know there's thousands of these gas seeps out in the northern Gulf. They're everywhere. And so, good fun. Well, let's go fast through this stuff, but you can see in the friction layer what happens to current speed as you get near the bottom, centimeters per second units down there. So something less than 12 or something most of the time. Um, but that's, this is averaged over a 20 day, 21 day period. And the same thing with directional stuff. So it's swinging around through that friction layer as well. Okay. So what's next with this kind of stuff? Well, what we want to do is not just put down one lander. We want to, put, we want to triangulate around a source. So what happens? Are you all familiar with Hercules? Uh, platform that blew up, caught on fire, and melted itself. It was only in 15, 50 meters of water offshore here, a gas well. Uh, it it self-sealed. They were lucky. The pipe self-sealed. The sand filled in. It'll leak again someday, maybe. But here we're out looking at, looking at our, we have good acoustics. We can talk, by the way, I should have mentioned, we can talk to our landers and we can actually interrogate them for data. It's, it's battery uh, intensive use. But if you want to know whether your lander is working and you've just put it down, that's a very valuable asset to be able to, to do. So we can look at the initial methane data, the initial optode data, and, and we can say to ourselves, okay, we're going to leave that baby. It's working. And so we put down three sometimes. Uh, this is sort of a schematic that sort of failed. Here's landers and a, a plume and so forth. And ships tracks, and this is actually an image of interpreted um, data. So let's skip on past it. Uh, okay. Let's 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 do one other thing with the data. I want to I want to have some time for discussion and so forth. So I want to race through the rest of this. But current three-hour averages. If we look at two Minilander data sets, I want you to get some sense for how well how coherent the data sets are when you have multiple landers down. And this shows you. Uh, ML1 and ML4, Mini Lander 1 and Mini Lander 4, current speeds uh, at one period and uh, over one period of time, 
This data, I think, is 2017. At any rate, you can see that we're in good agreement between the two landers. And so if, if we have three down, the third one failed to deliver methane data. I just didn't include it here. But we're now in the business. There are some local oddities which allow you to figure out, is there something weird that happened at that one particular lander? But there's big coherency here in what's going on. I believe that this combo of ADCP um, uh, and optode oxygen and um, methane sensors is really going to revolutionize what we can do out there. And this is just direction set the two different mini landers. This is, uh, I should have put this in sooner, obviously. This is the Hercules uh, platform, which of course burned up. Uh, it melted the whole system. The methane concentrations were huge. We still weren't quite ready when this one went off, but now if there was such a, an event in the Gulf, you'd hear about it on those loudspeakers. The H2S is coming your way because it's sour gas, and uh, you'd be running for your gas mask or whatever. And um, But uh, out there, what we should be doing, if it, especially if it was deeper, is putting our mini landers over the side. So they're pretty operational right now in that sense. Kind of expensive, but operational. <laughs> so... Okay, some, some conclusions from what we've talked about, and I have a couple more slides that I want to show you after this, but we need to make sure we have some time for discussion. Maximum and methane constants generally found near the base of the friction layer. That makes sense to us. The bubbles come up through the friction layer. It's sort of coherent as compared to what's happening above it. And so you see, that's the rule of thumb. If you go out to sample methane in the Gulf or you want to look at something that's coming from a seep source, that's one way to think when you're being physical about your planning. Concentrations typically in the range of 10 to 300 nanomolar. If you get right in a seep, you might even see thousands. You'll be in the micromolar range. But you're not going to see tens of micromolar unless you're in a very special situation like the Hercules. When the Hercules thing went off, the, even the shipboard measurements, people were in the hundreds of micromolar concentrations. Not surprising. That mistiness was all gas coming out. Uh, seat bubble, uh, an accidental rhesus, we can, we're now bragging a little bit. We're saying, and I get, use this slide when I'm t rewarding the companies that gave us money and support. They don't give us money, I should say. They give us equipment at super reduced prices, and if it breaks, I get it fixed for free. But there's a sticky point here, which is that Howard Menlovitz, my chief engineer, is known to those companies personally. So he's invited into their labs and into their material, and he shares. He doesn't even have to write disclosure forms anymore. They share their top things, and he makes suggestions, and he actually makes changes. So I'm really an, a big advocate for having engineering technical capabilities mixed in with the scientific capabilities. It's really important to have those people around you, and I think you all agree with me. The question is, where are we going to get the money to support that? And so. But I get it from grants. It's, it's tough to hoe. Okay, real-time sensor may allow directed water column sampling. Here's one that I'm throwing in for... I'm going to talk more about biology tomorrow morning with the student group that's coming here from distant places as well as here. But I believe that if, if since we can communicate with our landers in real time and look at what data are there, if we have a little snorkel on our lander and a little pump that can fill some little sequence of water bottles... I could collect a sequence of water samples for somebody who wanted to know how microbial processes were being affected by a known methane concentration. So aerobic oxidation of methane is something that's a specialty that, for example, John Kessler up at University of Rochester is a real star in. Um, Dave Valentine, people like that, they were really into this. And I think you all know there's big fighting over how fast the methane went away. Since we can't even trace the plume, it's hard to know how much of it got out. It's a tough ball game to do that. But there's possibilities for tying the biology into the chemistry and the physics here. So I want to have interdisciplinary mini landers. Okay. Let's finish up. So I was uh, put on this committee by President of the Senate Pro Tem Mark Basnight some years ago. Notice the date of this report is 2010. Um, and the letter is being sent to him from a committee that he's appointed. And the first line says, by strange coincidence, within a week after this report was approved, the Deepwater Horizon rig blew. 
So our report was due just about the, in 2010, April, and we'd been working on it. And I was part of a group where I was getting poison pin emails from people who said, no, we're totally ready to go drill off of North Carolina where the currents down deep are beneath the Gulf Stream, sometimes two knots. You can't run Alvin against it when we're out there sometimes. Uh, and so I was getting poison letters from people, and I would, of course, take those letters and send them out to the whole committee. And so they stopped coming after a while because the truth is hard to dispute, right? You just need to get it out there. But this denial of facts is a problem in our society. We're sort of rife with that right now, not to get political at all. But um, with this report basically got knocked right out because of it. You know. So I was there on, my, on this little computer showing the audience when I had a chance to talk out of the 12 people that were on the committee that every two days there's a release of oil and gas, hydrocarbon, somewhere in the world that exceeds 80,000 um, gallons of oil, a funny number to use, kind of why not make liters or something out of it, but that's what it is. And so if you look it up, there's spills going on all the time, all around the world. Are we ready for them? Well, I think we're a, we're a step further along with monitoring methane, but how about the rest of it? Um, and, and finally, I want to finish up uh, this Skark et al.'s little report along the east uh, coast margin. The southeast Atlantic is what, I, there's Cape Hatteras, just to get you in Cape Lookout near us and so forth. Um, look at these dots here and what you're going to see is that there are seeps discovered in particular all along this area in shallower than 400 meter waters. The reason I bring that up is gas hydrates uh, become destabilized under the temperature and pressure conditions that exist there at about 400 meters depth. So they're destabilized, they're going to dissociate, and you're going to get gas release. How does it really happen is what's interesting. Uh, so Skarkadow found all these seeps on the seafloor using EK80 uh, acoustic signals, which is really fabulous. You, they were out there to look at phytoplankton and all the rest of it, really great stuff. Um, the concentration of them was up at canyon heads and so forth, an important clue. And this is what they actually look like on the EK80. So this is from Reed Corbett who's an excellent chemist from the Chanton group at uh, Florida State University, um, and Bill Burnett uh, as well. This is 171 meters down, this is just a repeat. Look at these plumes of gas, those are gas bubbles. They're enormous, they're tens of meters wide. And what are they doing so shallow, and they're even shallower? And what's happening apparently around the world, out on those margins, and not seen for reasons that I think just involve looking for them with EK80 type talent. Um, it's everywhere and so the gas appears to be leaking up dip and out, out it comes around the canyon heads and so forth. So geology and control. Uh, a little bit of where that gas is coming out. These seeps are everywhere. Are we ready to deal with them? I think we're more ready than we used to be, but there's fascinating things going on there. So what's the biology associated with all this action? What's happening in the water column down there under the Gulf Stream? It's a new world that we're in, and I think all all you grad students and stuff and postdocs and stuff, this, this is going to be exciting things to work on because we're not there yet in terms of being able to observe the ocean efficiently enough to rule out all kinds of exciting things like this. So I think I'll stop there um, and, um, and see if there's some questions from the group. Thank you.